But right now, let's focus, shift gears for a moment as we explore Acts chapter 2, a new sermon series as well, and revisit some things of the past and look into the future. Sound fun? Let's pray and then we'll get into it. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this moment as we've worshiped and now pause to read the word together, to explore your precious truths. Please lead us as a family. Please lead me, lead each of us. As we open our hearts, touch us, please. May, may it be clear your message through these passages. So we have an action plan. So we have hope. So we have trust. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I remember it well in, in my career at that time, before I was called into ministry, for those of you who may not know me so well, my first career was in the wine industry. I was a wine grower, and at the time, at this particular time, I was a research assistant at Fresno State, and the lead researcher was driving me. We were in the truck, headed to the vineyard in somewhere in, in the Central Valley, near probably Lodi, somewhere like that. Lots of vineyards around this time after all the rain. I remember this was back in 1997 when there was that other big rainstorms that we had back then, like what we had now, but not quite like what we just went through. And we were having to wade through water almost knee high with wader boots to do our vineyard work in the winter. So as we arrived at this vineyard, it wasn't quite wet at that time, Greg said, you know, I get frustrated coming here because we're doing all this research, he's paying all this money, and we're explaining how he can have a thriving vineyard, but he won't do what we say. But we'll take his money and we'll do the research anyway. Maybe he was using it as an operating loss for his trucking company, he said. You know, he actually does better at shipping produce than he does growing it. But anyway, guess what he did? I'm like, what? Well, one time, they accidentally put Roundup in their, in their fertilizer machine and sprayed Roundup all over the vines. Now, Roundup, you might have heard glyphosate, you know, it's a cancer-causing agent, all these class action suits, you know. That stuff's terrible. Imagine that on a grapevine. Yeah, so it, it, it definitely did some damage and it took years for those vines to grow back because it's, it's a systemic agent. It gets into the circulatory system. It doesn't just wash off in the water. So it doesn't matter though, really, I'm thinking now, and I, I'm bringing this story to you to share this point. It didn't really matter that he sprayed Roundup on it and parts of the vineyard came back and some vines died and, and so on and so forth. Those vines were going to die anyway because that's just life. It's the aging process. Those vines will grow old. Yes, vineyards grow old, wither away, and you'll see things missing and vines gone here and there. And in a vineyard, old isn't necessarily bad. Old is not bad. Now you're might thinking, I might be old. I'm considering myself old. And I'm saying old is not bad. Amen? Because in a vineyard, for instance, Old vines are mature. They can wither, weather the storms. They've become resilient. They, they don't fall susceptibly to some pests. They can establish themselves while young vines grow in around them and fill in the gaps. And thus, through that process, you have a healthy vineyard. Now, a vineyard that's only growing old, now that, that's dangerous. That's a point of concern as a vineyard manager as a consultant. To grow old only is not healthy because eventually the life expectancy of all the vines will come to its term and you have a dead vineyard. However, the essential part of vineyard management is to grow young, to fill in the spaces with young growth, with new vines. 
and cultural practices that keep everything healthy as it grows and expands, not just good numbers of vines, healthy vines, old vines, new vines coming in, and then you have an established vineyard that can last indefinitely. As old, as the old dies out, new comes in. It's, it's a whole process, but to only grow old is a death sentence. Now, Jesus, and you know why I'm sharing this, because of Jesus. Jesus used the vineyard metaphor often in his teaching, didn't he? Right? He's the vine, we're the branches, the vineyard manager went out, he found laborers and all of this. So we take these parallels and we use them to teach spiritual truths, just as Jesus did, amen? Because with a good vineyard management system, you get a, a vineyard that has longevity. The same happens as we, vineyard managers of the church, use great cultural practices to grow young as a church, not to grow old. We need young growth as well. It can't be only this or only that. We need each other. Amen? So, the truth is that every church, just like every vineyard needs old vines and new vines, every church needs young people. Amen? And every young person needs older people as well in the church. Amen? We need each other. Our church needs young people, and they need our church. One without the other is incomplete. So today we start a new sermon series, but it's not really new. It's entitled Growing Young, and today's first sermon is an introduction, also entitled Growing Young, but it's not entirely new because I preached this series back in 2019. Four years ago, it was entitled The Thriving Church, but it covers these same aspects, shared some data and some cultural practices to grow young as a church, but we're revisiting it because it's been four years. How are we doing? How are things going? And we're going to go into more detail. Pastor Adam will be tag-teaming with me as we always do. So we're going to go in, into depth. But let's just get into this because this is growing young because it's, as the past one, it covers many of the details outlined in the book of the same title, Growing Young, by the Fuller Theological Seminary and its Youth Institute. So four years ago in this updated series, let us look at our progress. Let's see how we are doing and see where we were then, where we are now, and how applying these principles has helped us. Amen? Okay? And the first place we start is back to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Because that's a great foundational reference point of a thriving church that was growing young. Acts 2, 47, they praised God, demonstrated God's goodness to everyone, and the Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. So this is a growing church, and it was growing young because of addition, growing young. So how do we compare with this church, this early church, this first church model? Look around right now, literally, even outside. Look around. Are there spaces? There's some empty places where some friends and family aren't as often or haven't returned since COVID or, or what's going on. And in these empty spots, do you wish them to be filled? And think about other services because it's not just only about this worship time, other events, other ministries. Where's the help? Where the, where's the church community involved? Of course, it's important. We want more fruit for the kingdom for God's glory. Amen? We want new growth, young growth. We want growth of any kind. We want to see signs of growth in all communities, young and old. Are we growing? Are other churches growing around us? These are important questions, and we're going to answer these questions some today and as we go throughout this multi-part sermon series. And if we're not growing, what can be done about it? We have answers. Jesus, he's a great teacher, amen? We're just following his methods, really, is what we're doing. So let's define our reality. Our reality was, four years ago, a little over four and a half years ago, we were plateaued. We saw some crucial things that need to happen 
needed to happen. So we did an intervention. We had strategy sessions as a leadership team starting in 2019 with a church growth expert, Dr. Karen Crest, a Seventh-day Adventist expert, by the way, so don't be alarmed. We prayerfully worked together to let the Lord lead us on a plan, an intervention to change our culture, to be more outward focused as we nurture one another and grow young. Amen? We developed a mission and vision strategy. In fact, our vision, and you know this well, and some of you remember this document if you were on committees and leadership teams, we look at these almost every time we start a, a meeting. Our vision, again, this is, this is like an idea. This is, this is, this is a, a reference point. It doesn't mean every specific detail will unfold exactly like the vision says, but you get the point here. We see Temple City, SGA Church, full and vibrant, young, sponsoring missions globally and locally. We'll have ministries like child care and arts and a seat on the city council. A church involved in the lives of the community, sensing their pain and bringing them solutions like maybe becoming a blue zone, you know, like Loma Linda does it so well. Or the first place the community goes to for help. In other words, Temple City will be part of our community. Or in other words, the greater San Gabriel Valley because our mission is really, and every Christian church has the same mission, to complete the gospel commission, right? But specifically for us, we acknowledge we can't globalize the world, missionize the world, but Temple City Church exists to preach the gospel of Jesus, creating a multi-generational impact. Where? In the San Gabriel Valley, specifically, where all of us live. So that unfolded as we implement the mission and vision in a variety of ways, but also... Today, I bring this to your attention so you understand why your church leaders are applying and still applying and working on six essential growth practices for the church to grow young. But first, let's rewind a bit and see how we were back in 2018, 2019. Back then, our trend from 2004, why 2004? Because that's when the uh, data went online and it wasn't local. So that's as far back as we can go with the digital data. So 2004 to 2018, do you see a trend here? The trend is that it, it, it's kind of plateaued, kind of plateaued. Uh, this spot here, this deep drop in membership was because we cleaned the books. There was a lot of missing and deceased members that just hadn't been cleaned up. So that's an anomaly. Um, it, it, it's really a slight decline. This, this is probably an area we would just chop off. And, and what we're really seeing here is that it's a plateau. It's a plateau. That was 2019. We saw, oh, what, what shall we do? What shall we do? How are we today? There's that steep, steep incline, but we are on a plateau at the moment. Now we get it. Intervention, cultural practices take a while to see fruit. But there's some good news here. Let's look at another piece. Our members by age. And this particular area here is young people. That's interesting. About 10% young adults. Um, but also look at 2023. Go back. Doesn't change much. Really, the big change there is that the young people became older. We didn't lose young people, but they became older and moved into the older crowd and are no longer young adults. They're aging too, okay? How about worship attendance? Back 2015 to 18, you can see the ups and downs over time from 2015 to 2018. And then up to 23, we had the pandemic coming in. And so you, what you have here is a plateau coming along, and then there was a, a drop in in-person attendance, that's what the blue line is, but a large increase in online attendance. And now those two merge together, and what we're seeing, which is a sign that's encouraging, 
is that right here, total attendance is now on the upswing. Amen? From pre-pandemic numbers. Amen? That's including online. So now there's this hybrid connection with the faith community. Isn't that awesome? This is a sign of hope. Now, in this context, as we explore this and see this, is that we are not alone in this struggle, applying cultural practices to grow, to grow young, to be healthy and vibrant and so forth, to complete our mission and vision, just like every other Christian church of all denominations. How is the rest of the community handling things pre-pandemic, post-pandemic? What is going on there? We looked at that back in 2019 in the first installment of this series. And the reality is that most churches are in this same boat, plateaued, not growing, and not getting any younger. In fact, according to an extensive survey by the Pew Research Institute, the share of adults in the community um, that identify as Christian is dropping, and there's a rise in nuns, not N-U-N-S, N-O-N-E-S. In other words, religiously unaffiliated, agnostic, atheist, or no particular care. So Christianity was at 78%. It was a 7% change over a seven-year period, and that was just 7, 2007 to 2014. This trend continues to now, for the first time in history, and not because of the pandemic, first time in history, church membership in the U.S. is below 50%. So this is bringing in all denominations that are trying to share the gospel. In other words, no major Christian tradition is growing in the U.S. today. A few denominations are managing to hold steady, but that's as good as it gets. Now, there are some bright spots. Of course, you know that if you sat through this series back in 2019. Fuller Theological Seminary published the bright spots in this book, Growing Young, to show that there are bright spots where churches are growing. Not enough churches are growing, so the average is a plateau or decline, but there are bright spots where churches are growing, amen? Including in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. However, overall, the NAD data recent shows that as of 2019, 19% plateaued, 58% declining, only 23% growing. In Southern California Conference, 32% plateaued, 56% declining, and 12% growth among our churches. The last I remember seeing on the data is holding study since the pandemic with an uptick of attendance. Amen? Membership is declining. Look at a over 20-year spectrum here of decline in Southern California Conference. And what's happening? What's happening? Is it, is it through through being heretical and, and, and apostate? leaving or passing away or being disenfranchised, well, the majority of that right now in our context is transferring out, out of state, mostly to Texas and other places. Now then, how do our existing numbers as a denomination, as a community of faith and Christendom, all denominations together, and as a local faith community, Temple City, Southern Day Adventist Church, how do we compare with the rest of the country's numbers on growing young, of having youthfulness in the midst of a corporation, of a society, of a neighborhood, in the population. Well, on average, as of 2015, young adults comprised 17% of the adult population, but in the church population, only about 10%. That's something to be concerned about. We would like that to be equal, right? Have comp comparable involvement in life and in the life of the church, outside the church and inside the church, amen? 
At least we'd like it to be the same, to grow young. Temple City, about the same, 10% young adult population. In other words, this is brought up, this is right now on the screen. We're looking at this right now at this moment because as you look around and see any young people here or think of the young people near and dear to your heart, the data is still showing that among the young adult population within the church, if you took a picture of all of them, had them up on the screen, all the young people you knew, and went through and marked an X through every other one, that's the issue we're dealing with, that one and two will drift away. That's heartbreaking. That, this is a moment of concern and alarm. This should arrest our attention. And I know it does. That's why you are paying attention and interested in the answers and how we can continue moving forward and apply the principles, amen? Because we want this to change. We want this to be much better where there's no drift and there's growth among young adults in all age groups, of course. Amen? Everything has a life expectancy. That's the honest truth because we're in a sinful world and we're breaking down, whether it be our cars, our homes, or our bodies, and the church. But there's interventions that can come in to keep things lasting a little longer, keep replacing the old growth that's dying out and so forth. So as everything has a shelf life, an expiration date, even our own bodies, we apply principles to grow young so that as a group, as a family, as a community, we can continue on from generation to generation until Jesus returns. Amen? The church has a life expectancy. It has a life cycle, just like we do. Birth, growth, maturity, decline, and death. So the key is to create an intervention, to apply an intervention, to identify an intervention before decline, ideally. And you have a holistic cycle, a pattern that goes on indefinitely. But at decline, you can apply the, the intervention. Because the next step is death, and we don't want that to happen. Because Russell Burrell, in the book Waking the Dead, one of my professors at the seminary, he's studied this phenomenon in our denomination especially, and seen and published, and it's confirmed the average lifespan of a Seventh-day Adventist church is 70 years. Well, there's good news. Guess what? Vincent reminded me this morning and confirm the date. January 23, 1953, the Temple City 7th Avenue Church was founded. Amen? 70 years ago. Are we dead? Maybe we are. I don't know. Are we dead? No, we're not. Are we on a decline? Maybe you're unsure. Pastor, I don't know. That was a lot of data. I don't know. Was it? No, we're not declining. Amen? But it is the data is a moment of concern to st pay attention, to stick with it, to keep applying biblical, cultural, church growth practices, amen? So that we don't tip over from plateau, from growth down to plateau to decline. Yes, things go up and down, but we want that trend to trend up over time for God's glory, amen? And guess what? There's hope. We have hope not just in the data and the fact that attendance is up and giving is up and smiles are bright and white, amen? We have hope in Jesus Christ. As we have this sense of urgency to continue applying these principles, we have hope in Jesus Christ. We have hope because we're gonna share through this series the bright spots of how applying these practices works how it transforms young and old, how it invigorates the church, and then the church is entrenched in the community, and the community gets transferred, transformed, converted, and joins the church, walks close with Jesus. Amen? I hope this is your desire in this series, so stick with it. Continue to catch up if things 
get busy. It's going to be online as always and posted so you can rewind and post and share and take more notes because we are learning and will learn that lasting vitality and a vibrant congregation, a thriving congregation can be fostered especially by growing young because to grow young implies, means, and has to happen, will happen, and can only happen by applying a holistic biblical approach to church growth. And our hope is in Jesus Christ and following his methods. Amen? The church needs young people, and young people need what? The church. One without the other is incomplete. Up on the screen is a quote from John Friedman, North Pacific Union Conference president in August 2017, he was, writes this, we can no longer ignore statistics that show our Seventh-day Adventist church, our denomination in North America is aging. Our older, wiser members are precious to our church and essential to our God-given mission. However, we have a generational crisis that is not adequately being addressed. We are failing to adequately incorporate young adults into church ministry and mission. So that he's speaking about North America, okay, the United States and Canada. So collectively, this is a crisis. So we should continue as a church because there's some good news. We've applied these principles. You have, I should say, because you're a part of this, even if you're not on the board, because you participate, you help, you give, you pray for these things. We are doing several things that show that we're taking this crisis seriously as a church. For starters, what's going on in the fellowship hall right now as we speak? Not preparing for lunch. Yes, that's happening. I'm not talking about that. We're planting a young adult church, amen? New Life SoCal. Young people in 2019, John De La Paz and others, pastor, we have a passion for young adults. We want to do something. God is calling us to plant a church. What do you think? And the rest is history. It's not what I think. Is what God thinks. God was leading them. What happened? Board approval, so on and so forth, funding and prayerful resourcing and providing and helping and participating and allowing and adjusting our campus and sharing. Rent's expensive. So praise God, we have a facility to share at the same time. Amen? As we plant a young adult church together. We have an associate pastor who's passionate for youth and young adults, and equipped and passionate to serve here and to cut out his time to emphasize youth and young adult ministry, Pastor Adam Hicks, who, by the way, celebrated a birthday yesterday. So if you see him, embarrass him for me, would you? <laughs> and still a young adult, right? Amen? Isn't that awesome? We include young people in our worship service. We continue to foster our young people programs like Adventurers that feeds into Pathfinders and youth ministries and Sabbath school and so on and so forth. So we're applying these, amen? We're going to get into more examples and finer details of what this means and, and how this works out and things we can do more of. But we fund it, we participate, we plan, we pray, we share, we get involved. And so as congregations grow young, and as other indicators show that we're thriving with growth and baptisms and involvement and togetherness and, and, and the warm, fuzzy feelings that come from being close and connected, but yet in a large setting, we don't want to lose sight of what happens in a small group, so we create small groups, but we define it differently. It's any group that gathers, this is our definition here locally, that gathers outside of 11 o'clock and works together, studying, sharing, congregating, fellowshipping, leading people to Jesus, working together side by side, like the food pantry that's going on right now. Amen? 
getting ready to serve the community side by side with one another. Even now, some of the community are helping them as part of their setup team. Amen? Making connections, fulfilling our mission and vision as a team, as a church, as a family, as we grow young. In all realms, the Pathfinders, by the way, help and volunteer with set up and are scheduled, and you can be involved too. I see some of you, today's your day off from helping. Praise the Lord. You're in here, and then other days you're over there helping, and so on and so forth. I'll stop now sharing those details for now as we wind this to a close. In other words, the good news is there's more good news. We don't need a lot of things to grow young, to thrive, and to finish this work. We don't need the things that you would typically think we would need. Like, we don't need to be a precise size. Yes, our membership's over 550, but we don't need to be that large. But studies show, as the NAD is encouraging churches to plant churches, to plant churches, to reproduce so praise the Lord we're doing that, but it doesn't even take a large church to do that, even though they say large churches have no excuse to not plant multiple churches in their history. But we don't need to have a precise size or a trendy location, although we do have a nice location, amen? We don't need to have an exact age to grow young or an off-the-charts cool quotient, although Pastor Adam is cool. We don't need a big modern building, but hey, we do try to modernize it. It gets the job done, amen? We don't need a big budget, contemporary worship service, watered down teaching style. In other words, we can share the full gospel, SDA principles, and so on and so forth. We don't even need to be hyper entertaining teachers. None of that is needed. All that's needed is Christ's method alone, amen? Ministry of Healing, page 143, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior, this is what he did. This is what we're doing. This is why we're on the uptick of things, following Christ's method, mingling with men. You want to mingle with the community? Help with the pantry right now. Lining up to get ready to go to the pantry. He mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then... He bade them follow me. That's why these cultural practices take time to grow, to grow young and everything in between. Make relationships. Grow those relationships with patience and listening ear. A lot of not talking, a lot of listening. A lot of, a lot of helping in that way. Eventually, eventually Bible studies. Sometimes right off. It depends on their walk, but we'll get into that. We're going to get into some of the deeper principles of making disciples so this is a bright spot because the early church did it so well. So we're following biblical principles, the believers. This is the lead up to our scripture reading that Mark read for us today, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Leading up to that, verse 42, the believers, so this is how they got to the growth. Following Jesus' methods, he added to the church daily. Those who were being saved, verse 47, how? Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Amen? To community. In other words, to growing young, to their shared meals, to their prayers. Verse 43, a sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. Verse 44, all the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions, distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them, and every day they met together. Every day. In the temple and ate in their homes. They should see this community working together, living together, loving together. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. And here we are. They praised God and demonstrated his goodness the Lord added daily to the community. In other words, how did he add daily? Read verses 42 through 46. So as we continue to do this together and follow the principles outlined in these six takeaways from the bright spots. So in the midst of a downturn in global and North American decline in church involvement and attendance and membership and identity, those churches that are growing young, the churches that are growing young, including Temple City Church, all of them to grow young, it turned out in studying them, 
As Fuller studied thousands of churches, interviewed thousands of young people and old people and everyone in between, the bright spots showed that they did, they applied these things. They took Jesus' message seriously. To grow young, take Jesus' message seriously. Amen? That's what we're going to go through the next four or five weeks, taking Jesus' message seriously. What does that look like? So that's the next section of this series. There's also be the best neighbors, fuel a warm community, empathize with today's young people, prioritize young people and families everywhere, and unlock keychain leadership. So this series, I trust, will invigorate you, encourage you, give you hope, and allow you to understand why we're doing what we're doing as a church, why we're church planting, why we're food pantry helping and serving, why we're doing this, why we're putting resources into young people ministry, and why we're also putting resources into ministry for those who are not young, because we need each other, amen? So continue to be involved, and especially stay tuned for each installment in this series because we want Jesus to return, amen? We don't want to decline. No, we want to stay and follow through with the momentum for God's glory because what it means as we grow and grow young, it means overall we'll be growing, which means more souls for the kingdom, the work will be finished, and Jesus will return. Is that your desire, to finish the work so Jesus can return? No more heartache, no more crying, no more death, no more suffering, a new way of life, the old order of things will cease. That's what I want. Do you want this? Yeah? Please then join me in standing right now as we prepare for our closing him and I pray with you so that we ask God to finish this work through his efforts empowering us. Father in heaven, as we stand united, wanting to continue applying these biblical principles, the methods of Jesus in growing, growing young, as we grow old, as we mature together, especially growing young, filling in, leading, and loving one another. Everyone, bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.